Sweet. Is that going to close? Uh, close, please. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, now i got to find my Okay. Yeah, I had to load up my, um, my wife's old iPod mini. Yeah. Quite the mic, though, but it was a mini. Yeah. So that um, five-year-old daughter could listen to those songs because she she obsesses about the stuff. She is totally my kid, and she just wants to listen to the same like movie soundtracks over and over. And I'm like, here's an iPod, please, you know, load it with this music, and you know, yeah. Sure. Um, it didn't it didn't like last long because it was like a twelve-year-old iPod or something. Yeah. Like that. So that's that's the way my like that's the only things in my iTunes library is the stuff that I had to get on there and now it's just fifteen years from now when she's giving her first talk she'll be like so I had this old iPod <laughs> <laughs> it didn't last long but yeah, exactly. yeah. I let it go <laughs> oh hey oh but um yeah the Philly PWA meetup is uh, we just had our first one and okay. it was like a Let's work through. Let's like talk together about what PWAs are. Yeah. Which Jonathan um, is going to talk about right now. Okay. And awesome. Then we also work through a demo of PWA, like, like your first PWA. Like, yeah, like, yeah. The requirements. We've been. Uh, I'm Mark from Blizzard, hey. by the way. Um, and yeah, we just kind of fell into them. Yeah. And so we're we're like, oh, we didn't know we were doing them, and we're doing them. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're really geeked about them. So uh, yeah. If um, if you're part of the PWA Slack, okay. and we're, the organizers are in there and we're talking about like what future you know, yeah. content there is going to be because I think we're working through all of this new technology together and yeah. and so we're just trying to figure out what would be the most useful thing that everybody needs to know about PWAs. And, yeah. so, and, it, and we also have sweet stickers that we made with the, li the Liberty oh, Bell and everything like that. So, is that so nice. stays down right. if you're interested in these super exclusive stickers, you should right. check us out. We have a Twitter account. We have like a GitHub. It's my first time organizing a meetup, and I'm doing it with John and Christine, who are one of my colleagues at Think. Okay. I'm just excited, and I don't know. So, <laughs> I guess we should get started. What do you think? Um, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. How's it going today? Is everybody enjoying the the conference? Get a lot. Out of uh, all the different sessions. Woo. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I really appreciate you coming to hang out with me for the next hour or so. Uh, we're here to talk about visual regression testing and how could you be so sure. Uh, my name is TJ and I'm the director of software development at Think Company. We're a user experience research design and development firm. We have two offices in Philadelphia and one in Conshohocken. Uh, over 90 employees between the three studios and dedicated on-site client teams. And we've been around for 10 years. Our technology team, which I've been here since 2014, um, Kimberly Blessing, our senior vice president of technology, she founded back five years ago. So we're about half half as old as the rest of the company. And um, you know, I tried to touch on some of the things that are uh, our team loves about web development and software development in this talk. Um, but specifically, the visual regression part applies because what we do is translating uh, our designers' mock-ups and, and, and workflows into really well-made uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript components that can be integrated into any type of application. So uh, this was just one of those things where we've used in spots before. Um, but I just kind of wanted to share with you uh, what we like about it and, and in the process share with you some of the things that uh, our team cares about, I think, too. So, that's my face. Whole big slide, thank you. Our agenda for today, we're going to talk about what is visual regression, uh, visual regression testing. We're going to talk about why you would want to use these tools because for the longest time, I think we looked at them with kind of this curious like spirit, like, okay, that's really nice. I don't know how that would work in our projects. So I'm going to give you a couple ideas here. And those two ideas have to do with things that we, um, you know, encounter uh, at Think. Case study number one is we used Phantom CSS as kind of a dev tool on thinkbrownstone.com. So our old name, our old company name is Think Brownstone. We were going through a rebranding process. So I want to kind of show you uh, something that I worked through on my own there. And then case study two, we 
do pattern libraries quite a bit for our clients. And it's kind of the um, like kind of default deliverable when we're redesigning a client application. We have a dev component. Uh, we're going to put together a pattern library for them of individual HTML, CSS, uh, and JavaScript components that would make up a page template for them or several page templates. So I brought in Backstop.js at the recommendation of one of my colleagues there, and so I kind of wanted to show you how that one worked too. Okay. What this talk is aimed at is uh, folks who are just kind of very, a little curious about how what visual regression testing is and how you can integrate it into your workflow. I uh, don't go into a ton of detail about how you would like uh, integrate this into um, a really hardcore, uh, you know, continuous integrated setup. And uh, it, it, it is like kind of geared towards beginners uh, who maybe have some familiarity with uh, NPM and, and like. Dev, dev tools task runners. Like okay. So first of all, what is visual regression testing? And this whole talk has this my cousin Denny theme to it that sounded way better in my head than it ended up in the slides. So bear with me here. Um, visual regression tests compare screenshots of recent UI changes and then compare them against a known good set of baseline images. Okay. So this process is meant to verify that there's no unwanted defects that are introduced into a site stop zone. And so a good example of this would be, uh, this is the masthead from the thinkcompany.com careers page. And I, I have a couple different sizes. The screenshots up here are meant to represent our, our at the top we have our desktop tablet in the middle and the mobile viewport down here at the bottom and I've introduced a very slight margin bug here where you know it's it's kind of messing with the font size a little bit, it's messing with the line breaks, and it's messing with the height of the component of this masthead, which I would consider to be like one component that could be subject to visual regression testing. So on the one side is like what the actual state of it is, and the, the other uh, side of it is like what the state is meant to be. Uh, before the regression was introduced. And what's in the middle here is what one of these visual regression tools have uh, generated, which is kind of a diff of the two images. It takes a screenshot of this component. Usually it's a browser-based tool that is doing this. And it can kind of highlight for you, here is uh, in, in bright pink, or you can configure it to use whatever color you want. But here's the difference between these two images. And now you can go do something on, with that. You can act on that. And if you're using it as a dev tool, you can go and make that change manually. If you're using it as part of a continuous integration tool, you can tell it if there's X percent difference, fail the bill. Okay, that's not something that we've done, but we've got come close to it. But this, this is this is the type of thing that visual regression testing tools do. Um, some of the tools I'm going to be covering today, like I said, Phantom CSS is one, and I chose that because I already had a little bit of familiarity with. Phantom JS and Casper JS. Has anybody used headless browsers like Phantom or Casper or Puppeteer? They, they're so much fun. So, like, I, I love them. We, we have a couple different uh, things that we use from time to time with headless browsers, but Phantom CSS plugs right in with Casper JS. So, it's something that you know, we already use. And then Backstop JS is another one. Some other tools that you may have heard of include Wraith, which is a Ruby based tool that the, the BBC. Uh, dev team has actually published, and I've used that one before, and that, it's kind of an interesting use case that uh, we had there. Selenium with add-ons can do this kind of thing. So if anybody has Selenium as part of their workflow or, or tool set already, you can you can add some plugins to Selenium <coughs> to do this kind of stuff. And then there's other tools like Gemini and Percy. I'm not as familiar with, but if these don't fit, there is a link at the end of these slides, and I can publish them for you. You can go and check out like complete and exhaustive list of like all visual regression testing and CSS <coughs> testing tools for you to go through and find one of the tools that does. Um, so why would I need this? Why would I need a visual regression testing tool? All right, and this is a scene I love in the movie where, um, you know, Danny, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm? no, Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci's character, uh, Vinny, is testing a witness's uh, site on the stand. Has anybody seen, has anybody not seen my cousin Vinny? 
the funny story about this presentation is I hadn't seen it all the way through <laughs> until I started to make this presentation. It was just always one of those things. It's like I'm, it's on Comedy Central at every minute of the day, and so I, I always catch it at the end and have to keep watching it the rest of the way through. You, you got one of those movies? This was one of those movies for me. Um, it's a courtroom like comedy. It's the early 90s. Marissa Tomei, uh, you saw the screenshot. She's in it. Her performance in some of these scenes is amazing, but it kind of all has to do with, um, you know, uh, the memory, you know, uh, <laughs> photographic memory that Marissa Tomei's character has kind of swings the entire events of the movie. Um, and that just always makes me think of these tools that can say without a doubt, hey, this is. This is a very fine difference you're missing. Um, so reasons that you would need this. Uh, this can reduce visual QA, time and effort. If your uh, QA team or folks on your team who are responsible for QA are spending a lot of time catching things that changed in components that were considered finished or page templates that were considered finished, this can help. It can conserve developer attention and focus when used properly, so again, you're just making changes to a page template, you're making changes to a component, and these tools can run and tell you without a doubt, nothing else but the thing that you wanted to change has changed. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a little bit of a safeguard there. And it allows you and your team to avoid trusting human memories. In this case, the camera never lies, okay? And this is what this scene that I'm showing up here has to do with where he's kind of questioning the eyewitness testimony and the eyewitness on the stand's memory of their version of events from the day of the murder. So if you're you know, going back and forth with somebody on your team who's QAing the page that you're working on and they are saying, well, no, um, I'm pretty sure that this is the way that it used to be, but you don't have any screenshots to back that up, then sometimes there's a little bit of swirl that happens. And here you can just kind of say without a doubt, we've already taken screenshots and then this is testing X percent differently, and here's the areas where it's different. Um, as far as conserving developer attention and focus, uh, one thing that came to mind was a talk I saw from Kathy Sierra a couple years ago at a Fluent conference, which was called Making Badass Developers. Just remember <clears throat> that if, if folks are chasing down these little changes across their different components and templates, that is wasted. Uh, energy on there. That's wasted mental energy, wasted focus. It all comes from one, it's all one tank, which is basically the thing that Kathy wanted her uh, audience to know in that talk. So if there are ways that you can kind of focus on solving the hard problems and not chasing down little regressions and bugs all over the place, visual or otherwise, this might fit. <clears throat> so uh, the one case study that I wanted to share here was uh, thinkbrownstone.com refactor. This is a screenshot, a couple screenshots of the way thinkcompany.com appears today. Um, back in like November, December of 2016, we knew we were going to change the name of the company and that we were going to make some changes to the site. And um, that, that was just kind of something that I was spearheading myself to kind of allow my developers uh, on my team to focus on their client work. Uh, but we knew we were going to announce this at the first of the year, and I wanted to be able to take the designs that our team was making and make rapid changes. Um, we wanted to refactor our style sheets, right? Um, on the old thinkbrownstone.com, we were, this, this, the site in its current incarnation has been around since 2014. So it was like two and a half years old, almost three years old at the time. And our preferences and our guidelines had changed since the last redesign. We did the research and we just wanted to refactor a couple things to align with our standards and allow us to move a little bit faster, right? This January rebrand, I didn't know what changes were going to be coming, but I knew that if I wanted to move quickly, it would help me to, you know, do a little bit of cleanup before I received those and then, um, you know, then I could move according to the standards that we set in place. So we wanted to move quickly and efficiently, and so I thought I would take on a little mini project here. The problem was we were using uh, less, and we were structuring our files with uh, our less style sheets according to viewpoints. So we had three really big less files that were all being imported to main.less. 
according to viewport. We had mobile.less and tablet.less and desktop.less, and then they were all kind of a mile long because they had the styles for every component across the site. Uh, and so if I wanted to change like the hero image that you saw from the screenshots earlier, I uh, have to go hunt for that inside three of these really long, less, we, were, we were just not using less, uh, the, the import functionality, functionality of less and many of the other features like variables uh, in a sensible way. So, you know, if I, if I was receiving visual mockups that had different colors or different margins or font sizes, I, I was still doing a lot of work that you might be doing in a manual, you know, in, a, in a, like a vanilla CSS file. So I wanted to move a little bit quicker. Um, our team prefers SAS now, so that was a little bit different from when we originally coded the site. And we also like to factor our style sheets so that they're component first, okay? And then we're nesting our media queries within the components. So the way we wanted it to be uh, versus the way that it was at the time would be like a file structure like hero.sass, contact form.sass, and footer.sass. And so instead of all of those styles being nested within the media query uh, import, we're doing the inverse. Um, Kimberly Blessing uh, gives a really great talk about this called optimizing media queries. I've talked to a couple different people who have heard her on the Shop Talk show talk about this. Um, and so basically, there's no performance impact caused by, this is essentially going to generate hundreds of different media queries in the output of the CSS. But it's instead of just three in the other one. But that's okay, because basically, th uh, this is generating something that's more maintainable for us, it allows us to move faster, and um, the browsers don't take a hit as far as performance goes when you have tons and tons of media queries like this generates. So we wanted to do this. We wanted to finish, basically, with identical styles on all breakpoints before moving on with the redesign changes. I, I, and I just got to say here, like, this was totally optional. It was just something where I was like, I, I wonder if I can do this. I bet you I can do this really, really quickly. Um, and then we wanted to conserve our QA team's time by avoiding unwanted regressions, OK? So this is really important. Um, Brian McIntyre, who, who is our founder and our chief design officer, um, often gets involved with really big projects like this. And so I like sitting together with Brian, especially as the owner of thinkcompany.com, and review changes with him. So, you know, him being an executive and a founder of the company, uh, I don't want to be sitting with him and have him pointing out changes that have nothing to do with the changes that he asked for. So this was, this was something where I really needed photographic evidence that we had parity between the old less style that was like low velocity coding uh, time for me and the new SAS thing that I wanted. So I used Phantom CSS in German by a bulk task. The idea here was that we had two URLs. One was a local URL that I was running on my machine, and the other one was a production URL. You can see thinkbrownstone.com was the one in this little config file that I made. We're going to have a list of breakpoints for each page. So I really, again, like the screenshot show, want a desktop, tablet, and mobile. And then I want to give it a list of URLs to crawl and a list of selectors to screenshot and compare. I thought it was hot stuff putting this config mm -hmm. file together, right? Um, what this allowed me to do was write some gulp tasks with Phantom CSS in it. I was already used to writing Casper.js commands to drive that headless browser. So. This is what that looked like. Um, so you can see it's kind of consuming uh, my config object, and it's running through and, and doing these phantom commands with phantom CSS up there. So a couple of things that we ran into with this, where the Casper JS engine appeared to struggle with rendering web fonts like Google fonts or Typekit. Um, so we switched it over to Slimer.js. That's the nice thing about Phantom. Slimer is the Mozilla version of the headless browser. Uh, it's just, it's actually just not headless. Of it. That's all. That was okay for this purpose. And then after that, we ran into an issue where Slimer.js would hang after a number of pages were screen screencapped. So it wouldn't make it through the entire site. So what we ended up doing was using a child process of the thing in Gulp so that it would open up a browser, take a couple screenshots, close it, and start a new thread where we do that to the next page. So we kind of evaded the memory issues that way. Um, what ended up happening was I would run this, I would make some changes to the style sheets, I would run this, 
and then uh, it would tell me pass fail whether I was matching the components with the new SAS styles the way that they appeared in the old less format. Here's what that looked like. So I'm typing in gulp phantom CSS, that's my task. And it is, this is the Slimer JS engine that you see that is like opening up the two URLs. One is on my local, one is on my production machine. And here you can see after it's taken those screenshots, it opens up this little window to do the comparison. So you can see I have 15 failures. And I told it to dump all of these into a directory where I could click through and see what, what exactly was the difference. And then that helped me go through that mile long uh, style sheet that we used to have. And oftentimes it was just, here's a media query that's out of order, or here's a variable that's incorrect, or, or something like that. Um, I was very proud of this. Like, awesome job, TJ. <laughs> so, what happened was it took me approximately six hours. Now, I don't even want to think about like how long it took me to actually write the, the testing itself, but <laughs> to do the actual refactoring <laughs> took six hours. And then it took about two hours to QA and browser test everything and fix a couple things that, you know, when you're using something like Phantom CSS, you know you're only looking at Safari. So it does not also drive Internet Explorer or other browsers. So cross-browser testing was a little bit more manual. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, we teed up a more efficient development process for the thinkcompany.com switchover. Things were uh, much closer to the way that we would write them for clients in the project that was uh, billable today. Um, so and everybody that was involved with that process um, knew exactly where they were going and where to find things and didn't have to worry about, hey, this big less file was written. Um, you know, two and a half years ago, and uh, it's kind of all out of order. And then the development team was much happier with a more organized project. Jiffy was down a couple of days ago. Otherwise, I would have had uh, Marissa Tilney at the witness stand doing this. <laughs> this is really half baked with the my cousin Vinny tie-ins. I'm really, really sorry. Um, so anyway. Uh, that was a very interesting project. I, I really enjoyed sharing that with um, my colleagues, and um, we've used it in spots since then. Uh, I wanted to share another case study, which was the pattern library checkout that we, we ended up trying a different tool. Okay, because um, one of the first things I ended up doing was um, telling my team about this, and Kevin Doyle, who is one of our senior developers, he worked on one of our dedicated Comcast teams at the time listened very intently to me tell this tale about you know, Phantom CSS, and he's like, oh, it sounds like backstop. <coughs> I was like, cool, thanks for <laughs> telling me I didn't Google things all the way. Uh, so let that be a lesson to everybody who just jumps in to start to write your own tool. Google just a little bit longer until you find out that somebody has made it for you. Start with that instead. So this is the tale of me trying out backstop.js. Um, so we, like I said, we use pattern libraries quite a bit in our deliverables at Think. Um, it used to be, as a design company, we would, we would hand off a style guide, a flat PDF, and uh, good luck, dev partner, or good luck, client dev team. And uh, for teams that didn't have that, um, you know, that front end expertise, they really found it hard to write patterns and, and templates that were well-tested cross-browser, uh, cross-browser compatible, or sometimes they just kind of lost something in the translation, and other times they didn't get implemented at all. So the build kit was like one of the next steps for our in-studio projects where uh, it would be much more helpful to hand off this like documented guide to, here's the HTML you just need to copy and paste it from this documentation that we're giving you, and integrate it into your application. So, that's how we use it. The idea here that we prescribe to our clients is that every UI element should be represented on a single up-to-date page in the app. Um, so it should be like a living resource, unlike a style guide that just kind of sits there in the box. And uh, new components should be added to the library before being used in user interface or user-facing templates. So that's a really important part is like it should go into pattern library before you actually start to wire it in to your live template and it should pass QA in there first. 
Does anybody here use pattern libraries as part of their development workflow? Sweet. Does anybody use them as part of your workflow in Drupal? Yeah? yeah. I'd like to talk about that with you a little bit later because I, I, I was Googling like how to share like patterns between uh, a pattern library like this and the actual template that you Precursor, see. Precursor, I'm a PM, but I can get you the right person. <laughs> okay, all right. I am very interested in that, so um, yeah. So what do we do? Uh, what do we want to do? We want to give ourselves confidence that we're not breaking something in another part of the site by adding or changing a component. So we're assuming that we have a built-out pattern library and we are adding or changing components. And then other components we want to remain identical to the baseline states. Right? So here's what Backstop gives us. Uh, it is another NPM-based tool, so you're just doing NPM install. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say just. You're doing NPM install Backstop and it gives you that command line to use within that project. And what it allows you to do is commit a set of baseline screenshots. And again, it uses a list of breakpoints and selectors like before. It gives you this out of the box, which is way different than dreaming it up and doing it on your own with a config file. Um, and then it throws errors and shows diffs if a component doesn't match the baseline screenshot. So you can see on the right hand side here, this is the config file that it generates for you, which is awesome. And it's really similar because it gives you like named breakpoints, it gives you URLs to hit, and you can give it all other kinds of instructions like look at this selector, don't look at this selector, and so on. So um, some thinking that we did about this tool was we thought it might become a little tricky to implement this when you have lots of front end developers working in parallel just because uh, the idea with backstop and the screenshots it generated would be that you would not be using this the way I was with my Phantom CSS tool and just ignoring all of the screenshots it generated. Here instead, this would be part of your repository and it would be part of your tests directory and you'd be keeping those screenshots for other developers to refer to. So you have this whole other like set of files to worry about in your, in your file system to pass fail against. <coughs> Uh, Backstop.js recommends a global package installation, so it makes continuous integration testing an issue. Not a huge issue, but you know, if you're a DevOps person, I think that you can probably figure that out. And I was a little out of practice. And then would the deceleration in front-end development be worth it for the protection this provides? Because again, if a pull request that comes in here, when you're changing a file or you're adding a file, or a component rather, the baseline image, or the updated baseline image, needs to come along with it and be committed to the project too. So that was the idea anyway. Here is a look at backstop running, and you can see I'm using the backstop command instead of a gulp task that I've written. You can probably alias this if you wanted to, but I'm testing <coughs> backstop test, and it's using Slimer.js here. And so you can see that it's like automatically steering those browser windows and resizing those browser windows. It's doing all those screenshots. The nice, awesome thing about this here is it generates this little static HTML page with Angular to, to have these modals pop up to show these images that were just living inside the directory before. Now it actually gives you a tool to go in and compare them side by side and it gives you a little scrubber to show you what is the difference left, right, left, right. So you can see the accordion here is where I've intentionally mangled one of my, um, uh, you know, I took the baseline images with like backstop JS's command to generate those images. I committed them and then I intentionally created a regression for this demo on the accordion. You can see it also inadvertently caught a regression because it thinks the animated loader, which was at a different point in its animation cycle when it took the screenshot, is also a regression when it's not. So, you know, there's some thinking to be done around animated components like that. Highlighting and everything in bright pink for us. So, this is something that's currently in the evaluation stages for us. Like, once we add this, then it is another thing for our client dev teams to support. So, we're not sure. In studio projects, where we would be using this on our own, usually have a really a lot shorter turnaround time. So, you've got to ask yourself if you are taking six to ten weeks to build out a pattern library for a client, do you really need a whole visual regression testing suite for those six <coughs> to ten weeks, or are you just going to do one big manual regression test at the end before you deliver? Um, 
what we anticipate is that it's going to be a little bit more beneficial for on-site project teams where we have a couple different folks who are you know, embedded for six months or a year or even longer with client dev teams as their front-end developer. And then they, they're in charge of maintaining those applications long-term. That is the type of like project lifecycle where we can see, all right, well, this component that I'm writing is now conflicting with this thing that we forgot we had over in this corner of Xfinity.com. And now, who wrote this when it's different? Why do we write it this way? Like this, this is the kind of thing that would prevent those kind of visual defects and, and errors and everything. Um, so, just to recap here, and I, I want to take plenty of questions too. Hopefully, you come out of this excited about the potential that visual regression testing tools have for your workflow. If you see a spot for one of these tools in your Workflow. It's even easier if you're already using NPM or node-based tools to pull one of these things in and to generate some screenshots and get started. So consider adding it to your test suite. Um, we as a team are all in on component-driven front-end development methodologies. So uh, hopefully you got a peek at the pattern library type stuff that we're doing and the way that we're structuring our style sheets and it gives you some ideas if you're not already using uh, you know, that type of workflow. And uh, there's a lot of different tools and the, for different scenarios that you can try out. So, like I showed you, uh, you can use this as a you know dev tool for a very specific thing. Um, we've used again, we've used Wraith before on a pharmacy website, a pharmaceutical website that's reviewed by the FDA. So we'll run the entire screenshot tool across the end. We'll spider the entire site to make sure that only the changes that we've made are the changes that are appearing on the site or else that could be really expensive to have to go back to the FDA for a second review for a pharmaceutical site like that. Like that is another scenario where if, if you're just talking about assessing how many things are different, it might make sense to pull one of these tools in like that. Okay? So the appendix here uh, we have some things uh, like uh, resources for you, like a survey of screenshot-based CSS tools. Uh, if you're in interested in phantom CSS or backstop, uh, if you are interested in watching My Cousin, I just did a really, really poor job of even doing a uh, Joe Pesci impression at all in this talk. We have our dev standards. We have uh, Pattern Lab stuff in the talks that I referenced from Kimberly and Kathy Sierra here, optimizing media queries and making badass developers. Uh, that went way, that went really fast. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm on Twitter if you want to come hang out and chat. And you can also email me. And if you're interested, we are hiring developers. We're hiring .NET developers too. So go check out our thinkcompany.com slash careers page and you can find out what, um, you know, what job listings are open, what we're looking for, and some of the other cool benefits that you get from working with us at Think Company. So. That's it. Mm -hmm. Which site is static or dynamic? Um, which site? The Lake oh, Brown. Oh, the Brownstone. That, that that is a WordPress driven static site. site. That is a WordPress driven site. Yeah. Did you, did you do any testing with dynamic websites at all, or? Um, we have a lot of web pages that have slideshows. Yeah. Our marketing team may change content. Yeah. Um, so we did not do any testing of that okay. nature. Um, if we were testing patterns like that, I guess we would want to have a pattern library first, and then that pattern library would probably pull in static content that was the same always. Um, and then when we are using it with a dynamic site, the content is so static. Again, talking about that pharmaceutical website where it just may as well be a static website because the content changes so infrequently and has to be reviewed by the FDA each time you touch a page. So um, if you wanted to test a dynamic site, I think that one of the things you might want to do that I've seen talk, uh, discussed before but haven't really implemented because I'm not too much of a DevOpsy guy is to pull in database of the site in a known state. You know, so this is our this is the way the site should look 
before you start the visual regression testing. And even if that database is old and the content is old, at least it should match one to one the things that you're screenshotting today. Yeah. Another thing you can do in that situation is um, some of the tools, like at, at least for I know, you can execute some JavaScript before the screenshot is taken. So you can, in fact, just take out the piece that changes a lot, and that piece won't be tested, but the rest of the paper will be tested. But yeah. But mm -hmm. um, well, that well, that occurred to me with some of the animation failures I got too. Mm -hmm. Was if there is a way to like add a class to get the animation, like a component with an animation, to stop animating and stop in a predictable spot, then take the screenshot. Um, you know, the thing that I wrote doesn't like handle that, but Backstop actually does. Backstop and and actually Wraith have okay. You're going to screenshot this URL or you're going to screenshot this selector, but before that happens, you are going to fire this JavaScript file, you know, you execute the contents here, and that stuff could contain, hide this, or, you know, pause this, in order to kind of get the page into that stable state that we want before we start the captures. Um, could you say a bit more about the workflow and what kicks off those Phantom JS parts, like, is that something that you're doing selectively at different points? Is it tied to every time, you know, they run the build tasks on, you know, components in the pattern library? Is it up to the dev? It's it's up to the dev. Okay. And in this case, I wrote them specifically to um, support the, you know, the process that I was doing, which was this totally optional, um, you know, refactoring that I was doing. So I would make a couple changes, I would run the thing again, it would tell me where the new failures were, or it would tell me that I got it, and that my SAS compiled output was the same as the less compiled output from before for that particular component, yeah. and then go give me new failures on the next component, and then I tested it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we started to like, lightly touch on how this could be like used in a continuous way yeah. by teams, but like we're too skittish at this point. Yeah, 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 <laughs> we haven't yeah. found the right opportunity. Cool. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, the use of Phantom okay, CSS, it seems, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is assume it's used in an environment where you have a website with that any anonymous user can access. But we have several sites <coughs> where most of the functionality is actually behind a login page, you have to log in to actually do yeah. a lot of what we do. So is there any, do these tools provide a way to be able to say, I want to take a comparison of a login user mm -hmm. and see what they're gonna see versus just like an anonymous stat page? Yes, so is it, like one, one, of the, one of the sites, if I were, I have written some of these tasks to handle staging sites that we have behind basic authentication, but it sounds to me like you're talking about user authentication, like, you know, here is, um, you know, Joe user one two three password yeah. one two three, um, and so Casper and these other browser-based tools do give you the option to. I could have written some JavaScript that says, that each time I come to this route, it's going to stop me and force me to log in here. So wait until the form is available and then fill it out with these things, which you could store in like a .m file or something, so that it stays out of the, you know, version control. But yeah, you can definitely use Casper. Um, more recently, I've used uh, Puppeteer, which is like Chrome's official headless browser thing, and, and it does all the screenshot stuff, that this stuff that, that, that Casper does now. But yeah, you can steer it to like do any actions that the user would normally be doing, including let me log in before I look at this route. Did you use a specific uh, tool to plug in for or is that part of the CSS? It is, the dependency it uses is called resemble.js. But it's part of the family. Yeah, and you can use resemble.js on alone. So if you have diff needs that do not relate to <coughs> headless browsing in any way, but you just want to look at images that maybe are generated by some other tool and create a diff, resemble.js is the underlying dependency there. Um, I think that it is 
the uses image that that in and of itself uses image magic under the hood to do the diff and to generate that um, that pink image that tells you how much of it is wrong. Um, but yeah, that's that. Those are the tools I think you would be looking for. Yeah. And again, most of the stuff that we were looking at here was like Safari only, or in the case of when we were using Slimer JS instead of Casper JS as the underlying headless browser, Mozilla only. So sometimes I get asked, can we use Internet? Can we use this with Internet Explorer? Can we get diffs from all browsers? And unfortunately. Um, none of the things I showed here are that quite that awesome. Um, but if you do, it doesn't Phantom take care of that. Uh, no, Phantom Phantom has Phantom is WebKit, basically WebKit under the hood. I thought it could emulate any uh, browser. I don't believe so. I, I, Phantom JS is is WebKit, Phantom and JS, was like and then. You know, if you want Slimer JS as the browser, that's not headless, but that is Mozilla. So, you know, Phantom CSS gives you the ability to swap out the browser engine, but it's basically those two. Because yeah, what? Where are you shot? I'm very sorry. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I feel your pain there, and yeah, yeah. Uh, like this will catch, so, like, hopefully so many things for you, um, yeah, we'll and then reduce, reduce at least the the workload across the board a little bit and allow you to s test differences specifically in Internet Explorer instead of just all differences, hopefully. Any other questions? I ran a little fast here, and I think it's just because I did not do any of the bits from the movie. And, uh, it's been a while since I watched it. I can't. I can't. Are, you, are, you, are you actually using Pattern Lab itself? Is that the tool you're using uh, for this? Interesting that? question. Yeah. Um, at the time that we started using Pattern Lab, we decided that we wanted that something that was statically generated, and Pattern Lab didn't have that yet. Yeah. So we we built our own little dumb clone in Harp JS. Okay. Yeah. And Harp, we kind of outgrew Harp over the years. We tried to contribute to the project, but like, it would it wouldn't let us configure some things like, hey, I'd like to generate unminified CSS from the style sheets I'm using, mm -hmm. or uh, I'd like a different template engine. Um, so what we ended up actually switching to recently was Fractal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I see a lot of people who love Pattern Lab out there, and now mm -hmm. Pattern Lab has, you know, a JS version that you can use. <laughs> if we were looking at it today, we would look harder at it. But at the time, we were just kind of like, ah, we need something really quick that just generates static files yeah. that can, because the thing is, I think we have clients with all different types of technical needs, and we didn't want to say, here, you know, you have to set up a PHP server yeah. to set up to, to host Pattern Lab. We, we looked at Fractal, and Fabricator was the other one we looked at. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I know Fabricator. I'll do it. Um, okay. Actually, it worked out okay, like for the little Google that we had. Uh, we did it in Fabricator, but the taxonomy on the stuff is fairly lightweight. Um, awesome. Cool. So, this tool is called Phantom CSS, you said? So the first tool that I used was Phantom CSS, and then I got made fun of by one of the guys on my team because Backstop.js did many of the things that I was doing with Phantom. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, are they open source or the license? Um, I believe they're open source. I don't know quite. I don't quite know what the license is. If you have licensing restrictions, actually, nonprofit. I'm I'm actually not sure about that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's always a gray area when it comes to show up. So we're probably running right into the same issues okay. that you did. Yeah. Does anybody uh, here have a uh, visual testing uh, uh, of that group shop? Yeah. Or? Yeah. 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 Right. 
that's why our project that was straight off the select That is a sick burn. Shots fired. Uh huh. I'm gonna use that from now on. That's awesome. Maybe now you can go into Joe Pesci. Yeah. <laughs> Using how many hours? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you for being here and thanks for being in this session. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to come grab me afterwards, I'm around. Uh, <coughs> Twitter at TJ Nicolaitis where I complain about the Phillies. Yeah. Thank you. Who knows? Thank you. 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 Thank you.